My girlfriend and I were on this off-trail hike that had an extremely long and steep cliff to reach a small rock overhang that looked over the cliffs and the ocean. As it came into view, we noticed there was already an old lady sitting up there with a sketch pad. We started making jokes saying maybe it was not a woman but actually Norman Bates waiting to throw us off the cliff or something. For about 20 minutes, we were kidding around like this, and as we finally approached, you couldn't see the top because it was so steep now. We finally made it to the top of the tiny overhang. At that point, the old woman turned around to look at us, and we noticed it was an insane-looking man wearing a dress, not a woman at all. His hair was tied in small braids with rubber bands. To be clear, this was not like a normal-looking cross-dressing person having a quiet afternoon to themselves in the wilderness. Their eyes were bug-eyed, and they almost looked like an escaped convict or something. We said hello, and the man said nothing at all, but stared at us. We tried to act as normal as possible, and calmly turned around and headed back down. We got the hell out of there not long after. Let me preface this by saying that I realize camping alone in the middle of nowhere is not exactly the smartest activity a person can engage in. I've lost count of the amount of times that well-meaning busybodies have lectured me about it, but frankly, I just don't care. You see, all my life I've done things I didn't particularly want to do. I went to school, I got a job, I paid my bills... Camping in the stillness and solitude of the forest at night was the one thing that gave me joy. And joy seemed to be in short supply most days. I never felt afraid in the woods, no matter how remote. I only ever felt calm and peaceful, like I was doing what I was always meant to do. Now mind you, that does not mean I never took any precautions at all. There are three things a solitary woman needs in the woods. First, a good first aid kit. Second, a good compass. And third, a good dog. I always went down with all three. I always thought those things would keep me safe from whatever might be out there in the forest. I was wrong, of course, but that was just because there were some threats I had never considered. The last camping trip I'll ever take started out fairly normally. I had planned a three-night loop through a stretch of woods I had never been to before. It was unfamiliar and had very remote terrain. In fact, I would not be following an established trail. I was only planning on hiking about eight miles a day before setting up camp each evening. That way, I would never be too exhausted to make good decisions. I could also generally enjoy my new surroundings more thoroughly. I loaded up my pack with all the supplies I'd need. I told my parents where I'd be, and when I'd return, and headed out to a part of the state that was completely foreign to me. I arrived at the forest early in the day, and parked alongside a deserted stretch of gravel road. I could see no signs that the road had been driven down in quite some time. The thought of having an entire section of the woods all to myself filled me with a moment of glee. That moment intensified when I opened the passenger side of my car to let Susie out. Susie was the type of dog that provoked endless speculation about her genetic line, but ultimately she was just several different kinds of mutt all rolled into one. Not particularly intimidating to look at, though. Susie was very loyal and protective all the same. I would never go on a hike without her by my side, and she was never happier than when she was walking along with me. Susie gave me confidence that I could handle whatever the wilderness threw my way. With my pack loaded high and heavy on my back, Susie and I headed out into the woods. The route I had chosen was quite rugged and varied, and often I had to stop to check my map and compass. I had opted to walk along the ridge line the first day, and found that the way was a gauntlet of loose rocks and fallen trees. There were no signs of humanity there at all. 
No empty bottles, no trails to pull me back into civilization. Despite the hard going, it was paradise to me. That evening, I set up camp at a clearing near one of the higher ridges. I turned in a bit earlier than I'd originally wanted to, driven into my tent by the cold bite of the early fall air. Susie snuggled in next to me as I zipped myself into my sleeping bag. Before I knew it, I had been lulled into sleep by the chorus of the chirping night insects around me. I was woken up in the early morning hours, though, to complete silence. A quick glance at my watch showed it was around 1.45 a.m., too early to be anything other than dead asleep. The full moon above illuminated the night sky, and I spent several seconds watching the shadows of the tree branches dancing along the top of my tent. It was downright cold by then. I zipped my sleeping bag more tightly. I looked over at Susie still laying next to my body. Her eyes were open and focused on something beyond the tent. The wind must have woken her too, I thought. I closed my eyes, hoping to fall quickly back to sleep, when I felt Susie growl against me. I murmured a reassurance. It's probably just a deer pup or something. Though, something didn't feel right here. Susie wasn't the type of dog to growl at anything passing by. She lived her life as though other creatures were curiosities at best and distractions at worst. The only time I'd ever heard her growl like that was two years ago when a black bear came shuffling down a trail and caught us off guard. In a weird way, the thought of a bear outside the tent was a bit of a relief. My bat was hung from a tree outside and bears in this part of the country weren't known to be aggressive at all. I stroked Susie's fur and waited for the animal to sniff around the campground, determined that we weren't interesting, and then leave after a short while. I strained to listen, but all I could hear was the sound of Susie's growling, slow and constant. I waited for what seemed like hours, but never heard the animal outside. As the morning went on, Susie's growl had turned into soft whimpers. I let her crawl into my sleeping bag with me. The sleep that came was fitful and interrupted by strange nightmares. The morning sun eventually made its way in and woke me up. You may be wondering at this point why I didn't turn around and walk right back out of the woods to my car and drive back to civilization. Well, the simple reason is that I wasn't too worried. I thought an animal had come around the campsite. It wasn't that big a deal. Besides, I'd be another eight miles away by the time night came around again. I packed myself up, had a leisurely breakfast, and set out again. The morning hike was uneventful and beautiful, though Susie stuck disconcertingly close by me, neglecting her usual explanation. Every time I tried to pet her, she stiffened, so I let her be and continued walking. We stopped in a quiet clearing for a late lunch, more than six miles into the day's hike. It wasn't until I was packing up to leave that I noticed the complete silence in this area. No birds, no cicadas, no rustling of leaves where squirrels were leaving from the trees. It sent a chill down my spine. I noticed Susie watching the woods ahead. Let's get out of here, girl. She looked up at me and whined. When we arrived at the edge of the woods, I immediately saw why there were no bird songs in this area. There were many little feathered bodies laying across the forest floor, dotting the fallen leaves with red, blues, whites, and yellows. I poked a bluebird with my hiking stick, turning it over looking for any signs of predation or illness. I saw nothing strange other than the mere fact it was a lifeless body. I expected to need to call Susie to me. Birds were a favorite snack of hers, but she had backed up behind me, another low growl escaping her curled lips. I stepped back to her and clipped a leash to her collar, fearing that she might run. The woods remained dead silent. My heart had frozen in my chest. It clenched tightly, but somehow was beating forcefully at the same time. Something was very wrong here. I knew I needed to get out of here. I stood where I was and tried to think about things. I was about 14 miles from where I'd parked my car. If I went back the way I came, given the terrain, 
I knew I wouldn't make it back before nightfall. I had in my pack a compass and a map. I could try to map out a new route, one that might take me back faster, but there was no guarantee I could find my way back before dark either. I was at the halfway point of the route, and I had to make the decision to keep going or turn back. I thought back to the campsite the night before. Something was out there. Maybe it was just a bear, but maybe it was something else. The thought of going back to that spot to sleep made me shudder. I knew I had to keep going. I'd get as many miles as I could during the rest of the daylight hours. Get a few hours of sleep and then finish tomorrow ahead of schedule. I just had to make it through another night and I'd be back to my car. I steadied myself and forged ahead. Susie was tense beside me, hackles raised. The miles melted behind us. There were no stops and no breaks to look at flowers or have a snack or anything. Just the constant sound of my boots striking the ground to break out the unnatural quiet. When I came to the next clearing, I had to step carefully through a mass of bodies where a flock of starlings had been downed. As I walked, I kept an eye on the trees around me, but saw no movement, only that awful stillness. Slowly, the light began to fade. Its rays became orange and diffused through the leaves. I knew I had to stop. I couldn't keep going through the night like this. The tent, though made of polyester and carbon fiber, would at least allow me the illusion of security. I found a clearing mostly devoid of all these dead birds and set up camp there. Susie whimpered. It's okay, girl. We'll be out of here tomorrow. I promise. I was in my tent before the sun finished its descent behind the trees and wrapped tightly around one of my hiking poles and Susie right next to me. Whatever or whoever was out there, I just hoped they would leave me alone. I drifted in and out of consciousness, the strain of the day overcoming me in waves before the nightmares pulled me back into the waking world. Susie didn't sleep at all as far as I could tell. She just laid there very stiffly, every so often emitting another low growl and licking her lips nervously. While I was awake, I listened to the wind moving the branches above me, but nothing else was making a sound. I mentally clung to the creaks and groans of the trees, something familiar and reassuring in this strange place. Eventually, though, that too became twisted and bizarre. The branches swayed above me, casting shadows across the top of my tent. The wind sounded as if it were dying down now. I sat up in my sleeping bag, freeing my arms and drawing Susie closer to me. The warmth of her little body and the feeling of her breathing gave me comfort. That was moments before we both heard it, a crunch of heavy footfalls right outside. Susie lunged for the tent door, frantically clawing at the fabric and whining. I tried to hold her still, but she was fighting me back at every turn. When the fabric ripped, there was nothing I could do. She bolted into the night before I could even process what just happened. I fought my way out, still clutching the hiking pole, but hopelessly aware of how little good it would do me. I emerged into the little clearing of my campsite, illuminated by a full moon. The trees were motionless, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The hairs on the back of my neck stood to attention. The only thing I could hear was my own ragged breathing and the quick percussion of blood through my ears. I backed slowly into the bark of the nearest tree, feeling totally exposed in the clearing. Minutes passed by, or maybe hours. The silence continued around me. I could think of nothing else to do, standing alone and vulnerable in the night, so I started talking, at first to myself and then to whatever was there with me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. I'm leaving, I swear, just one more day and I'll be gone. I began to cry. My voice started to sound hoarser and hoarser as the night went on. By the time the gray morning light began to seep through the trees, I was numb from fear. I was unsure I could even find the strength in my legs to hike out of this place, but I did. 
I left my tent where it lay, now visibly in tatters, and started into the woods alone. The rest of the day barely registered with me. If I'm being completely honest, I remember the silence and the feeling of being watched. When I finally made it back to my car, I didn't even have the energy to cry. Sometime later, when I felt well enough to revisit my experience, I looked up this corner of nowhere online. I read stories about the isolation in the wilderness of the forest, about the logging crews who had abandoned their machinery, and how the trails had all become overgrown and useless. I had seen those stories before my trip, and they excited me. The solitude of it all, the remote rugged terrain that had driven the less adventurous away. But now I had more context. I understood that this type of forest was not for me. It wasn't for any of us, and I'm pretty sure it will stay that way for a long time. So this happened a few months ago, and I'm still scared to this day. My entire life, I had never really walked home from school all the way. I had always either been picked up or ridden the bus. This year was the first year that I lived near enough the school to walk. I wasn't in the nearby neighborhood where 90% of the kids were. We were only living in our current house temporarily. I would have to walk maybe half a mile to get home, across the highway. At the beginning of the year, when I first started walking home, I didn't want to have to walk by the highway. The high school had a cut through in the forest that led to a strange and creepy lone road. I wanted to get home fast. I walked down to the forest to get to the cut through point when I saw that some older kids appeared to be following me. Maybe I was just being paranoid though. I ignored them, and they actually did turn out to be unimportant. For some reason in my head, I had the Halloween theme just stuck in there, like when Michael Myers would stalk people. It was a really eerie sensation. My gut feeling was that maybe I should have taken the highway instead. Still though, considering the thing with those older kids turned out to be nothing, I kept on just walking through the forested area and got to that lonely road made out of gravel. There was dead grass right in the middle of it growing out. I could see the area where the highway is. The road seemingly extended deep into this brambly forest. I decided maybe this was a waste of time. I turned around and took the highway path instead. The next day though, I didn't want to give up. I wanted to conquer my fear of this road so I foolishly went back. It was the same thing. As I walked down that eerie lone road with dead overgrown shrubs growing on it, I kept getting this eerie feeling the whole time. I noticed there were absolutely zero cars or people coming up and down this road. It was like it was completely abandoned. I kept walking into these big spider webs right in the middle of it, which proved pretty much that there hadn't been cars there in a long time. Otherwise, how would there be so many webs between all these trees? I continued walking down this road leading to nowhere, just going deeper and deeper. I was starting to get a bit scared at this point that a car would come down the road and not see me, or maybe somebody would come and take me. Who would even hear me scream out here? I started jogging up the center. I saw a big gap in the forest where there were power lines. Finally, I thought to myself, the ground next to the lines was still overgrown and full of tall grass and thorns. I kept walking into this area, taking my sweet time. I finally made it to a small ravine. I jumped over it and continued on my way. I eventually got stuck though. There was a big bush. I didn't want to walk through all the tall grass around it and get dirty. I must have been trying to work out how to get around the bush for a good two minutes, when suddenly I was slammed with an ominous sensation. I looked up and saw a man standing a good distance away from me. I didn't move or say a word. My heart was pounding. This man was very creepy. He had dark green clothes and shaggy brown hair. He was just staring at me. 
A big grin came over his face, and he gestured for me to come over to him. He then stepped to the side, where I could no longer see him. I could hear the leaves crunching, though. He was coming after me. The adrenaline had been flowing for about 30 seconds now. I bolted lightning fast up the hill. I didn't care about not getting dirty anymore. I just knew I needed to get the hell out of there. Eventually, I emerged back to the highway area. I turned back to look, but there was no sign of the creepy man. I made it home just fine, and I promised I was never going to try to cut through that forest again. The scariest thing is, though, if he had just stepped slightly to the side before I had seen him in that forest, I would have never noticed him coming. I could have made it up to that area, he would have grabbed me easily, and I would never be seen again. The way he grinned and made his way towards me was very eerie too. Any normal adult would have said something like, Hey, are you lost? Can I help you? Nope. This guy just stood there and stared at me for who knows how long. All I know is it caught me completely by surprise. I can safely say I've never tried that shortcut again. I will occasionally go to the top of the highway and look down that path, but I'll never go deep down that road ever again. It's so weird how it seemingly leads to nowhere. I've not encountered the creepy dude since, and hopefully I never will again. So I live on a remote New England street. I just moved here recently from New Mexico. We moved into a gorgeous house about four driveways up from a Mormon church. This church has services at random times. I'm agnostic and not really tuned in to the schedule that they keep. Tonight, I was driving home from work and listening to a new episode from True Crime Garage podcast. I didn't want to stop listening, so instead of driving home, I slowed down my speed so I could finish my episode. I decided to do a slow lap around the church. As I listened, I was super paranoid because of all my true crime obsessions. My car doors always remained locked. Because we live in a safe and upper class neighborhood though, I was not terribly on high alert, even though the church was dark. As I cruised slowly around it to enjoy my podcast some more, all of a sudden, a man stepped out of the shadows from behind the church's dumpster and out into the light. He was walking in a bizarre stumbling gait and actually lunged at my car door. He had a beard and was otherwise kempt and clean looking. So what was with his odd manner of acting? It really scared me, so I floored it and drove off as fast as possible. He lurched after my SUV again, his nails actually scratching the metal of my back door. I was so freaked out that I drove for a long while not going home, but just kind of circling random streets until I finally arrived. My husband is out of town for training. He's military, so it was just me and my two pit bulls. They made me feel pretty safe. I do also have a gun that my husband bought me. As an aforementioned true crime addict, I'm always on edge. I called up my husband for reassurance, and he assured me it was probably just a homeless guy, but to keep the gun at the ready and the dogs by my bed, just in case. I start doing my nightly routine and head to bed. As I'm falling asleep though, my dogs start going wild, barking and rushing from door to window. I kept my hand on my gun as I listened to them barking over the pounding of my own heart. I could hear the front door knob rattling as someone tried to twist it open. My dogs were still snarling and barking. After a few seconds, one of them hit the window downstairs, barking their head off. I slid out of my bed and grabbed my cell phone, dialing 911. About 30 minutes later, cop cars pulled into my yard and took my statement. I was still terrified and shaking, and when I went to the door to talk to them, the porch light illuminated footsteps all around my door in the snow. They circled around to each window, 
I could only imagine it was that same guy from the church earlier, but I have no idea how he knew which house was mine. I parked in the garage, so he must have been watching me as I came home and recognized my vehicle as I pulled in. My husband is home now, but I'm scared stiff. I won't even walk in front of our uncurtained French doors. I'm that terrified. I've almost been kidnapped twice. This is the story about the second time. I just graduated from college and was living outside the major city my school was near. There's public transit around here that's relatively reliable, so sometimes I would go into the city for special occasions, knowing I could get back safely. For Halloween that year, my boyfriend and I decided to take the train and actually go to an event, not just a house party. This is only important because of how it influenced my outfit. As a woman, there are a lot of footwear rules you have to follow. I was worried if I didn't wear heels, I might not be allowed into the club we were going to. I honestly debated for way too long, and switched between heels and flats a couple of times. I was wearing a black dress that I turned into a Black Widow Spider costume by putting a red cutout on the front. In the end, I ended up wearing some black sneakers. The night was great and relatively uneventful. I didn't get hassled for my shoe wear at all, thankfully. At some point, I decided I was exhausted though and wanted to head home. My boyfriend was still going strong and didn't really want to leave yet. That wasn't really a problem though. Since we'd taken public transportation to get there, he gave me the keys to his house which was about a mile from the train station. We planned that I would head back and he would join me a little bit later. The mile I had to cover went by a mall, a school, and finally a church, and abruptly ended and turned into a row of houses that my boyfriend lived on. There was a designated sidewalk the whole way, but it also ran along a four-lane road. I knew there was potential for running into late-night vagabonds, but I figured they'd mostly be around the station or the mall. By the time I was at the church, I could see my destination, which was the second house on the row. I considered myself safe as I passed the church on the right sidewalk. I was about 200 yards from the house now, when I hear a vehicle start to slow down as it approaches me on the left. The speed limit for the area was 35, but people often fly down it, I'd say about average, people go around 45 miles an hour on this road, given that there were two lanes each way. The van had been going 45 as well, because the sound of it slowing down rapidly was very noticeable. I turned and saw a white, hard-sided, really dark-tinted front window van pulling over. Luckily, it was going so fast it was not able to stop until it had passed me by, about 20 yards ahead. It just sat there, idling at the sidewalk. I stopped walking because there was no reason for a van to just suddenly stop like this out of nowhere. I didn't want to walk by the big sliding door. After about 30 seconds, which felt like an hour, of the van just idling there and no one getting out at all, I decided to quickly scoot on up to the church flower beds so I wouldn't be close enough to be grabbed by anyone. At first, nothing happened as I passed by, and I felt dumb for being paranoid. That's exactly when I sent a thousand prayers for deciding to wear flats that night. After ten seconds of me walking onward, I heard the van gun its engine, and I watched as it zoomed by and screeched to a stop in front of me, about ten feet away. It literally jumped the curb onto the sidewalk, with the tail sticking out into the road. Hearing the driver's door now opening sent a jolt of adrenaline I've never felt before or since through my body. I took off sprinting in my glorious sneakers. As I passed the front of the van, I saw the driver passing the side mirror, meaning he was already outside the car, attempting to make his way to me. As anticlimactic as it is, that's basically the end of the story though. 
because I hauled my ass all the way to my house without stopping, running the fastest I've ever run. I'm pretty sure I could have given an Olympic athlete a run for their money. I even cut through some trees to lose him. I wasn't pursued any further. As far as I could tell, the man chasing me was not able to keep up. I got inside and locked the door, and spent the rest of the night just fine. I'll always be grateful I ended up wearing flats that night, so I could run for my life properly. I don't really like considering what might have happened if I had been wearing heels instead. Despite living out in the middle of nowhere on a 400-acre farm, somehow we've still had problems with someone coming into our home, moving our stuff around, and occasionally even taking something, like trash bags or food. It started in early 2016. We would be laying in bed and hear random stuff being moved around in the middle of the night, by the time we'd get up to check, though, there would be no one there. Still, though, the damage was done to our old front door after someone tried to get in several times. This behavior wasn't consistent, either. It actually only really happened once or twice every couple of months. Last month, though, I heard a car door shut in the middle of the night. When we went to check, the lights were on inside. Our motion detector lights had tripped outside too. This would continuously happen at all hours of the night after that. Well, I saw this person for the first time last night. It was only a brief glimpse, and they were wearing dark clothes as well, so I didn't really get a good look. By the time my husband got out there to confront them, they were already gone again. We don't know where they go to, but we always hear them running. Sometimes down the left side of our house out towards the field, where there are woods beyond, and sometimes down the right side. Today, I had my music playing over a speaker in the kitchen while I jumped in the shower briefly. Not four to six minutes after, though, I heard the sound of my music shutting off suddenly. I got a real bad feeling. I felt like I should just stay locked in the bathroom and not go to investigate at all. I'm glad I did. My music had been paused, as my phone had been moved completely. The front door was hanging wide open, and there were mud tracks all over the floor. I've always had an issue with anxiety, and I'm kind of a paranoid person anyway. It's super hard for me to attempt to stay calm with all of this going on. My husband will be home soon, and keeps texting to make sure everything is okay. I'm not stressing too bad, because I know that's not good for the baby. Still though, I hope we can eventually figure out who's stalking our house, and that we can find some way to get rid of them for good. My family were hiking a mountain in Alaska. We were down in a valley a couple of miles from the summit, taking a rest at a scenic spot with a few other groups of people. There were maybe 20 to 30 in total. Some lady in the group got a phone call from someone at the summit. The person at the top could see a black bear up on the slope, heading down to us. There were three cubs on the opposite slope, and us in between. Everyone started panicking and just ran. Some people tried to go up the mountain, and some down. Nobody wanted to be in between, for obvious reasons. It was honestly more scary because of the way people reacted than the actual threat of the bear itself. Lots of people around us were old or had small children, but nobody seemed to care about anyone except themselves. They left all the kids and old people behind. We undoubtedly would have been completely safe if people had just been calm and stayed as a group, doing all the things you're supposed to do when a bear's nearby. But everything the park rangers drilled into us for an hour before we went up there was just completely forgotten in a moment. Several people were almost trampled to death. It was a frightening scene.
During my first and only semester of college, my very good friend Sheik was dating this girl named Stacy that we both knew from high school and was 18 at the time. I'm now 26 years old. Now, many people back in high school did not like Stacy, and I was one of them. To me, she was the definition of a sketchy person. She was a pathological liar and not even a good one either, as her stories very rarely added up. She would constantly contradict herself, sometimes only minutes after she'd spouted her lies. She was one of those girls that hated drama too, yet it always seemed to magically follow her around everywhere. She was constantly in and out of relationships throughout high school and would constantly go out of her way to prove that they were crazy by spreading rumors about her exes and getting as much sympathy from everyone around her as she could. She always had to be the center of attention. Wherever she went, I remember something bad happening along with her. I remember during prom night she was dancing with her then boyfriend. He accidentally stepped on her foot while dancing, and she caused a huge scene about how he was physically abusing her. It was painful to watch. There's much more I could get into about this girl, but just to say in general, she's an extremely toxic person. Nobody should have to be subjected to or be in the presence of her. It was also worth noting she had a drug problem that she would often try to hide. As you might imagine, this will come into play later. Anyway, back to the story. Sheik and Stacy had class together and hit it off rather quickly. He was skeptical at first, but when he brought up her reputation in high school, Stacy claimed that she was weird by an ex-boyfriend, and that was why she acted out in the way she did. She was working on getting better and was now perfectly fine. My friend, being incredibly insecure about being single and being way too trusting in other people, believed her right away. He began dating her, and almost immediately the relationship became extremely dysfunctional. It was rampant with emotional abuse and manipulation on her end. The aspect I really want to focus on, though, was her constantly trying to squeeze money out of him and her aforementioned drug problem. She would constantly ask him for small amounts of money, usually ranging between $10 and $20. Sheik didn't mind all that much. He bought into her story of struggling financially and felt real bad. One day, though, she asked him for too much, $500 to cover her rent, to which he refused. She immediately flipped out on him and didn't talk to him until she drunk dialed him later that night and began to reveal she was doing drugs. It was all because of how terrible her life was and that he wasn't helping at all. Honestly, I have no idea why he didn't just break up with her there and then, but the next day they talked it out and made up. The issue was dropped, but that's where everything finally started to come to a head. It was around 10.30ish on a Friday night, Keep in mind they had been dating for nearly two months at this point. I was chilling in my room with another friend of mine. We were just sitting on the couch bullshitting about random things going on in our lives when I get an urgent call from Sheik. He explained to me that Stacy was hanging out at a friend's house and asked him if he could come pick her up around midnight. The buses in that area had stopped running after 8 and she needed to be at work by 9 the next morning. He said sure, and as the time he needed to leave to pick her up drew closer, his mother called him saying she was working overtime and wouldn't be out until around midnight. She had the car, so he asked me if I could drive with him to go pick up Stacy. I'll admit I would have rather left her to her own devices, but he sounded pretty desperate, and he was an amazing friend who would do anything for me. I decided to do him a solid and told him to start walking over to my house. He arrived about 40 minutes later. My other friend went back to her own house. She lived right across the street from us anyway. I got in the car and he texted Stacy, telling her that we were leaving now and that I was driving him, to which she responded with the dreaded K. We got to Stacy's friend's house, which was located on the very outskirts of town in a sketchy neighborhood. 
The area was very poorly lit, and just to my luck, the streetlight in front of her friend's house was completely broken and off. I refused to park there, as I didn't feel comfortable sitting in the dark. I parked three houses down between two other cars under one of the few functioning streetlights. He texted Stacy, Hey, we're here! She didn't respond. As we were waiting there, a truck drove by, and I noticed four men inside. At first, I figured maybe they were lost and looking for an address, but this thought was thrown out the window, when not even two minutes later, the truck drove by again, this time much slower. The guy in the front passenger seat made direct eye contact with me as the truck passed by my car. I told Gish something was definitely wrong here and to call Stacy right now so we could leave as soon as possible. He agreed and called her. It was dead quiet outside, so I could hear the conversation pretty well. Hey, where are you? We're down the block, come outside. I'm looking outside right now. I don't see your car. We're in my friend's car. It's a gray Subaru. Almost immediately after, the phone call dropped out. He looked at his phone in complete confusion, wondering what the hell was going on. I was starting to get extremely nervous now, though. Between the truck that was circling around before and Stacy's sketchy behavior, I decided that something was up here and I was not just going to be a sitting duck. I pulled out of the spot and drove up in front of the house. As I'm pulling out, though, I heard a vehicle loudly in the distance behind us. I look up in my rear view mirror and see the truck from before now gunning it up the block. I freaked out and floored it out and began speeding up the block as well. The truck caught up with us and Sheik yelled at me to turn, that they were trying to shoot the car. To my horror, I looked behind me and the guy in the back seat was leaning out the window with a gun in his hand, aiming directly at us. I quickly turned and floored it down the road as they struggled to follow behind us. I turned left, narrowly missing an oncoming car, and slammed down on the gas. Luckily, I was halfway down the block by the time they'd even turned out onto the road. I was surprised I was driving as well as I was at the time. My friends said I looked extremely calm and determined during all of this, but inside I was clearly freaking out. I was worried they were going to run me off the road, or we'd even get a bullet in the back of our skulls. I made another left turn and drove like a bat out of hell towards the highway. The truck turned onto the block but then stopped as I got closer. I turned onto the highway and emerged into the next lane. A few minutes passed by, with us going back and forth on who the fuck those guys were and what they wanted. That's when he got a call from Stacy. He picked it up and put it on speaker and shakily said, Hello? Where are you? I'm fucking waiting for you, she screamed. He explained the situation, to which she proceeded to call him a liar, and said he was never there and he was standing her up. Of course, he lost his shit at her. He screamed at her that we'd almost gotten killed, and called her out on her bizarre behavior. Throughout all of this, she started yelling again, but then she went silent. We heard a door open quietly, and someone in the background calling out. They got away. Stacy, where the fuck are you? Silence followed this for a few seconds, before the line went dead. We looked at each other, and we both knew she had something to do with all of this. Long story short, we spent the entire drive theorizing on why this all happened. We think we may have hit the spot on what actually occurred. When she'd asked for the $500, she probably needed the money to pay off a dealer or something. She had to find another way to pay off her debt. We think she set us up to head to that house. And those guys were probably the dealer and his buddies who would conveniently show up looking to rob us of everything and possibly jack the car, hoping it would cover her debt. She probably hadn't realized we were using my car, which explains why they circled the block in confusion and why she hung up the phone immediately after he gave her a description of my vehicle. She'd possibly called the dealers to update them. I dropped him off at his house and went home myself. I know people say that after scary encounters, they're always shaken up and their emotions are running in a million directions. I was just emotionally drained. It felt like I couldn't feel anything. 
I just wanted to go home and go to bed, which is what I immediately did. I filed the police report the next morning on those guys. They said they would look into it, but I never heard anything from them after I filed the report, so who knows what they've been up to ever since. As far as Stacy goes, our theory was further solidified when he showed up to class on Monday. She approached him and berated him for that night, claiming that she'd walked all the way home and had her phone and wallet stolen by some druggies. He basically called her out on the whole thing, claiming she'd set us up to be robbed. Of course, she denied and called him crazy. He told her they were done and she yelled fine and walked to the back of the room. The druggies were outside waiting for her. To our surprise, she never attempted to contact us again and kept her distance, probably because she knew we were onto her and wanted to keep the heat off her. After I dropped down, I never saw her again, and last I heard anything about her was from my friend, who told me she'd developed a long-distance relationship with some guy and dropped out halfway through the semester to move up north to live with him. As far as I know, that was the last time anyone ever saw or heard from her. Overall, I'm just happy I trusted my instincts and picked up on the fact that something was wrong. This encounter may have had a very different outcome. This happened to me back in the summer of 1989 on a remote speck of land in Pawnee, Kansas, back when I was 30 years old. It was early evening, and the sun was setting. There was a warm breeze outside, which I remember clearly. I had just burnt a bag of popcorn in my defective microwave, and had flung open the windows to air out the kitchen some. I don't remember what I left my house to go and find, but I do recall that after tossing the burnt bag of popcorn in the trash can, I exited out the back door and began walking towards the barn. I remember hearing a noise off to my left in the field. It sounded like a faint coughing of some sort, but I ignored it at first. My mind was focused on other things, and I wasn't even remotely worried about or considering the possibility a complete stranger could have been wandering across my property. As it turns out, I probably should have been. When I exited the barn and made my way back towards the house, I stopped dead in my tracks as I made eye contact with a very large and extremely unkempt man. He was about 10 yards away from me. Judging by the amount of gray on his enormous beard, I determined him to be at least 60 or older. He was barefoot and wearing stained overalls in addition to suspenders over his bare torso. It struck me as unnecessary and strange. His body looked extremely worn down and tired. His eyes were wild and fierce and full of malice. In his right hand, I could see he was carrying a hatchet. Before I could even form a sentence, I already visualized in my head how many steps it would take for him to reach me. I was all alone, a vulnerable young woman with no one around for miles to hear me scream, trapped out in the open by this man, who appeared to have sprung out from the grass, blocking the path to my house now. I'm not sure how long we stood there in a silent stalemate, but I recall I was about to ask him what he wanted. That was when the man spoke up. I remember his voice was much deeper and more elegant than I expected it to be. I'll spare you for some whiskey. I stammered something that I don't quite recall. The man raised his voice and screamed at me. Whiskey, now! I took a reflexive step back. The man started stomping towards me. He didn't raise the hatchet, but I'll never forget the hatred in his eyes as he closed the distance between us. And that's when it happened. Blood exploded out of the side of his head, and he collapsed onto the grass, making a sound like a grunt. I might be remembering things slightly out of sequence, but I thought I heard the crack of a rifle echo after he fell. I didn't stop to think or look twice. I sprinted for my kitchen, terrified that someone would fire a second shot at me. Once inside, I should have locked the door and called for help. Instead, I grabbed my car keys and ran out the front door. 
I climbed into my tiny red Volvo and drove to the nearest police station. It wasn't until I spoke to the officer at the desk that I realized I had blood spatter all over me. Three police cars escorted me home, at which point it was long after dark. They combed the area with flashlights and discovered a large pool of blood on my back lawn. There was no body though, not even the hatchet was left behind. They set up a perimeter and expanded their search, but by the time dawn came around and my husband returned, they had found nothing. No trace of the bearded man or whoever had fired the rifle. They asked me multiple questions about the man and the sound of the gunshot. I suppose they were trying to determine the caliber and perhaps deduce how far away the gunman had been standing. The incident happened so fast though that there was not really much information I could give them. The police brought out their hounds who traced his scent for over a mile into our backwoods until the trail suddenly went cold. Nothing further was ever discovered or reported to me. To this day, I can't describe exactly who that bearded man was, nor who ended his life right in front of my eyes. My family suggested he may have been an escaped convict or a deranged madman, and whoever fired that shot must have been hunting him. They chose to act in that moment to save my life, because I have no doubt that bearded man would have done some serious harm to me. Sometimes I bring myself to feel grateful for that unseen shooter, but other days I'm not so sure. Regardless of whatever my family suspects, I'll never know for sure if that person with the rifle had not actually been aiming at me. This happened a couple of days ago to me and my girlfriend. We were house-sitting for my girlfriend's dad. My girlfriend's dad lives in a rather large house in a suburban neighborhood just outside of one of the major cities in Denmark. What I'm trying to say here is this is not exactly a scary or dangerous neighborhood by any means. That only means this gave us a much bigger scare than it probably would have had it been in a more dangerous part of town. After coming home from buying groceries and stocking up on necessities for our weekend stay at this house, we went to the living room to lie down and have some quality time to ourselves, which we hadn't had in quite a long time now. Before I go any further, let me just clarify the lay of the land here. This house had a rather large living room and a floor-to-ceiling window at the end of the room. Outside this floor-to-ceiling window was a sensor-triggered light system. As we were lying there watching TV, I started to get this weird feeling, like something was watching me. At first, I tried to shake it off like it was no big deal. I was thinking to myself that I was probably just overthinking things because I was in a new house, where I didn't yet feel entirely at home. As I looked over to my girlfriend though, I could see that she too was quite shaken up about something. After a few minutes of silence, she asked me if I had the same feeling as her, as if someone was watching us. I tried to play it off as nothing, and I told her I'd just go grab a cigarette and check to see if anyone was out there real quick, just to make us feel safer. I turned my head towards the floor-to-ceiling window, only to notice the lights were on outside. That shook me to my very core. I quickly decided not to go out for that cigarette. I could feel my girlfriend squeezing my arm. As I turned around to her, I saw her pointing out of one of the windows. Outside was a silhouette of a person. My blood froze in that moment. I turned around and quickly grabbed my phone. As I turned back, I could see the person had already disappeared. I called my parents as I knew they were out at a friend's house not too far from where we were. My dad told me to lock all the doors and windows and sit tight and wait for them to arrive. A couple of minutes go by and nothing happened other than me trying to get my girlfriend to calm down. I knew how badly this could affect her blood sugar levels and I'd rather not have her have a seizure while a creeper, burglar, or even a murderer was skulking about outside the house. The silence was broken 
by the sound of the windows being tampered with. At this point, I was trying really hard not to freak out and cause any further panic. Luckily, seconds later, I heard my dad pull up outside the house. My girlfriend and I have since discussed who it might have been, and we've come up with a few possible suspects, one of them being my girlfriend's crazy mother, who has a severe mental illness. The other more possible suspect would just be a simple burglar. I don't really care who it might have been. I'm just glad whoever it was was scared off by my dad and didn't manage to break in that night. This happened four years ago, in the early hours of New Year's Day. For reference, I was 17 at the time, and I was in my senior year of high school. I was around 5'10 and weighed about 160 pounds at the time. I lived in the suburbs. I was at a New Year's party being held by a friend of mine, whose house was about a 20-minute walk away from my own. It was around 1 in the morning, and I was about to leave with another friend of mine who lived on the same block as me. The friend who was hosting the party asked me if I wanted a ride home. In hindsight, we probably should have taken him up on his offer. Our neighborhood was pretty safe though, and we figured that with two of us walking together, no one would bother us. Plus, there were probably other people at the party who would need a ride home more than we did. We said our goodbyes to everyone and began our walk home. The road was predictably empty, with no one but us walking along the sidewalk and maybe the occasional car passing by. Everything was pretty well lit, so we weren't walking in complete darkness or anything. My friend wanted to pick up a pack of cigarettes on the way home, so we stopped off at a gas station along the way. When we got to the gas station, it was nearly empty, with only a woman at the pump filling up her car and a guy outside the front of the store on his phone. We went inside and my friend bought a pack of cigarettes. As we walked out of the store, my friend was immediately lighting one. We reached the sidewalk when we heard someone yelling from behind us. Hey man, wait up! We looked behind us to see the guy who had been out front the store quickly walking to us. He looked to be as early as his mid-twenties. He was around 5'8", and 140 pounds by the looks of him. He approached us and asked if he could get a light as well. My friend and I didn't think much of it. He lit the guy's cigarette, and the guy thanked him. We began walking away, but the guy continued to follow behind us. He asked us where we were going, and we told him that we were headed home. He said that he was having a party and he was heading back over there, as he'd left for a moment to get some fresh air. He asked us if we wanted to come to the party with him. This is officially the point where red flags started going off. Why the hell would a guy in his mid-twenties ask two teenage boys if they wanted to go party with him? We told him bluntly we didn't even know who he was, nor did we know anyone at this party he was talking about either so obviously we were not going. The guy started laughing and said we seemed like cool guys. He told us that we needed to lighten up. My friend and I told him we were underage to see if that would get him to leave us alone. He just chuckled and said that age didn't matter to him. He had a brother who was 16 at the party with him, and his friends were all there too. Jesus Christ, could this guy take a hint at all? I thought to myself. We were less than 10 minutes away from our houses now, and we didn't want this creep following us all the way there. I firmly told the man we were not going anywhere with him, and to quit following us. The guy got livid, and started screaming at us for being unfriendly and inconsiderate, that he was just trying to be nice. He then started throwing racial slurs at my friend. It's worth mentioning that I'm white and my friend is black. My friend yelled at him to get away before he cracked him in the face. The guy then proceeded to run away from us. My friend and I looked at each other in complete disgust over what just happened and spent the next five minutes walking and talking about this creepy guy. We both agreed that he was probably drunk or high from a New Year's party. Next thing we know though, we hear a car behind us. It proceeded to slow down to match our pace. 
we saw the windows roll down, which revealed the man we'd just seen a few minutes earlier. He appeared to be with two of his friends, one of which was a man the same age as the guy, with a woman in the back seat, who had to have been in her mid-thirties. The guy told us we got off on the wrong foot and asked us once again to join them at their party. My friend and I looked at each other, and I whispered to him that we needed to get away from them right now. My friend told him we were not going with them, and to leave us alone. The guy was silent for a few seconds, then said, You're coming with us one way or another. They pulled over quickly, and jumped out of the car. That caused my friend and I to immediately go into flight mode. We turned right on the sidewalk. My friend yelled to run to the park and we'd lose them in there. We looked behind us, and to our horror, the three people were running right for us. We ran into the park, and once again looked back. This time, they were even closer. We ran for a thick patch of trees that covered a good portion of the west side of the park, hoping to evade them. I was panicking at this point, because I couldn't see a damn thing. I was worried that my friend or I would trip over something and get captured by one of these sick freaks who wanted to do God knows what with us. We heard one of them trip and fall behind us, cursing out loud. We made a left onto the path, and we heard more yelling behind. One of the guys was saying, Fuck, they got away! The woman yelled at them to split up and search the park. We bolted towards the bathrooms, which were thankfully still open. We hid inside and took a minute to catch our breaths. Our lungs were practically burning at this point. We should have called the cops and hid until they got there. But at the time, we were so focused on getting the hell away from these crazy people that we decided to try and make our way to the nearest exit of the park and run to my house. We waited for about two minutes, then bolted out of the bathroom and towards the exit. Shortly after we exited the park, we heard one of the guys yell from somewhere behind us that he'd found us once more and we were getting away. We looked behind us to see the guy in the distance starting to chase after us. We ran until we reached my house, and I quickly closed the door behind us. We were both sat there in silence, trying to regain our energy and calm down. We hoped they didn't see where we'd run off to. I looked out the window several times over the course of ten minutes. Thankfully, they never showed up again. We talked about it quite a bit, and we're glad we were both okay, and that nothing happened to us. We were trying to figure out what they wanted from us. Did they want to kill us, rob us, or something worse? My friend hung around for another half hour before he insisted on heading home alone. He left and I went to bed. I kept thinking about what happened. Eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up and told my parents about what occurred. They were thankful that me and my friend were okay, and they were upset with us that we chose to walk home. We should have accepted the lift from my other friend, or even called them. They would have come and picked us up regardless of what was going on. We filed a police report, and I gave them all the information I could. Unfortunately, we never heard anything about it again. Sometimes, I wonder what the hell they've been doing ever since. I really hope they never harmed another person after that. I can't express enough how thankful I am we managed to get away from those freaks. To this day, this incident is still the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, and it definitely made me more wary of my surroundings. And I try my best to avoid situations where I need to walk home late at night. By myself or not, I don't know what would have happened if those people got their hands on me, but I do know one thing. I hope I never have to see them ever again. <laughs>